All right, hello everyone. Uh, today's lecture is going to be on the stirrings of the modern American labor movement. Um, more specifically, kind of like the origins of the organized labor movement as it exists today. Um, the past three lectures, if there have been no, no other takeaways, of course, is that uh, labor history predates the American labor movement. We can go ahead and throw out a start date of 1877. Um, but people obviously have been working and laboring and contesting the nature of their work and labor for much longer than the last 150 years or so. Uh, but today's lecture, we're going to kind of jump back a little bit from uh, interrogating labor, labor history from a, a, a post-colonial or a feminist or um, a critical racial theory perspective. And we're kind of going to look just at the organizational history a little bit. Uh, part of this comes from the fact that in order to understand critiques of the way American labor history used to be told, just very much oriented toward, uh, you know, when a union was founded, when a certain strike was, who were the leaders and how it ended, this kind of very uh, institution-centric approach to history. If we're going to critique that, that model of history, we also have to at least understand um, the narrative that that, that that kind of history is giving us. So we're gonna jump in a little bit here, starting uh, with 1877, we ended up, uh, we ended our last lecture uh, with the end of reconstruction and kind of the imposition of the system of sharecropping and uh, racialized wage labor is a form of like hierarchy in the South after the Civil War in the last lecture. And we're going to kind of pick up with the industrializing uh, Northeast and Midwest. Of course, before we get started, I always want to offer an extra reading recommendation. This one's a little bit older. Uh, it was published at the end of the 1970s. It's by a historian named Richard Edwards, and it's called Contested Terrain, The Transformation of the Workplace in the 20th Century. Um, while this book is uh, over 40 years old now, um, it remains a pretty compelling piece of scholarship. People who are studying for qualifying exams with labor history are more than likely familiar with this book. It's kind of a seminal work in uh, labor history. Contested Terrain, while mostly focusing, uh, especially in its latter portions on the 20th century and the uh, implementation of corporate structures and the corporate kind of company worker is a model of social control, its earlier chapters definitely touch on what we're going to be talking about today, which is how um, everyday workers, craftsmen and, and uh, apprentices, master workmen, gradually lose control of the production process. Um, through a process known as de-skilling. And we'll get into that in a little more detail, but if, it, if any portions of this lecture seem particularly interesting to you, Contested Terrain is a great book um, that I would recommend uh, as, a, as a jumping off point for more historical study on this kind of topic. Let's go ahead and recap again really quick. We ended um, the past couple lectures with some nods to industrialization and its effect on the labor process. Specifically, industrialization and its system of wage labor upsets these two earlier competing systems of labor. Uh, chattel slavery, uh, which is predominantly in the South, it's a very racialized system of, of forced labor. Um, it's very entrenched in kind of like this uh, feudal hierarchy that's been brought over to the Americas from, uh, from Europe and applied to a, um, to a, I guess, intermediate region between temperate and tropical. I don't know what the, the ecological biome for the South is, but that kind of area that's more uh, centered around uh, agricultural production and the plantation. Uh, in the North, of course, we have this Republican articulation of free labor. Uh, free labor, of course, isn't synonymous with wage labor. In a lot of ways, free labor is just as opposed to wage labor as it is to uh, slave labor, because um, advocates of free labor who argue for this agrarian republic and for self-sufficient farms and small workshops that are controlled by the people who labor in them, uh, wage labor is very much uh, a form of coerced labor where people who have skill or don't have skill are more or less uh, dependent on their employers, uh, on their landlords, on people who provide services and avenues for uh, through which people can sell their labor for wages. Um, so free labor is 
also opposed to this system, but gradually as the country continues to industrialize, um, we see those earlier forms of labor start to be chipped away at. And we covered in the lecture on the Civil War how this uh, system of slavery in the South collapsed uh, within the matter of a few years. And this was through uh, just mass self-emancipation of slaves, which eventually prompted the federal government to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, right? Uh, in the North, the system of free labor is going to hold out for a little bit longer. Um, as America is industrializing, it's worth mentioning, and it's going to become uh, pretty uh, central to this lecture, but as America is industrializing and as there's the, this demand um, for more labor in these uh, newly urbanizing, industrializing, growing cities, America is going to see a lot of immigration. Some of this is going to be international. You're going to see immigrants coming to the United States from parts of Europe, parts of East Asia, all over the world. Um, but there's also going to be a lot of rural to urban internal migration. So people leaving family farms, uh, smaller communities to go for, toward the cities where job prospects are better. Um, we talked about this a little bit in our discussion on uh, women's labor. A lot of women left family farms to start working in uh, mills in places like Pawtucket and Lawrence. Um, this, of course, uh, if you'll recall from our readings, uh, generated some of the very first strikes, uh, the Lowell Mill Girls chapter from Loomis's 10 Strikes, Chapter 1, um, if you're recalling that reading, are good examples of this. But we should talk about the way that labor is being performed prior to this point, right? In systems of free labor, this, you know, when we talk about the agrarian republic, sometimes people have these notions that um, every single family is on these like disparate plots of land and uh, they don't talk to each other. They don't communicate. There's no commerce because everyone is self-sufficient. And this, of course, isn't correct. Right. Um, there obviously are much more people working in agriculture at this time prior to the Industrial Revolution and before the country industrializes. But there are still uh, centers of commerce. There are towns and cities uh, prior to industrialization where special types of labor um, kind of accumulate in focus, right? When you have an agricultural surplus that can support people not devoting their labor to agriculture, they kind of tend to congregate in one area where they can uh, share resources. And so in a lot of these earlier uh, towns and settlements, you see uh, the workshop, right? The workshop is the pre-industrial point of manufacturing and uh, manufacturing labor. Usually a workshop will, would devote itself to one or two things, maybe three things, uh, basically churning out these commodities and tools and resources that there's a demand for in the market. Um, if you look over on the right side of this slide, down at the bottom, you'll see a really good example of a Cooper's workshop. A Cooper was a person who made uh, wooden barrels. You might be able to tell this from context clues. Uh, wooden barrels were actually incredibly important to the process of transporting goods, um, especially from some of these more rural locations to urban uh, areas where uh, products could be sold. But um, these workshops, because they were spread out and because there was not the, they did not, they were not profitable enough to buy up these uh, newly created machines that were over um, in places like Europe and England and uh, North, Northwestern Europe, like France and the Netherlands. Because these were relatively small operations and kind of isolated in rural communities, there wasn't a financial incentive to buy a lot of large industrial machines. And so a lot of these workshops um, were kind of stagnant. And it isn't until you start to see the growth of the textile industry in the American Northeast that other sorts of manufacturing enterprises are founded with the capital to buy labor-saving industrial machinery that can do work like uh, the Coopers work much uh, quicker, much easier, and with a lot less effort. And so as this industrial process starts to take hold, these smaller um, workshop systems uh, start to lose their market edge and their profitability as rural communities start to be flooded with cheaper commodities from industrial cities. Now prior to industrialization, what would basically happen is 
a small community would have a, a network of these workshops and they would be governed by master workmen or master craftsmen. These are people who have spent decades in their craft. You know, if you're a cooper, you would spent decades learning how to make wooden barrels efficiently with your tools in your hands. You would own your own workshop, you would own your own tools. And to fulfill uh, contracts and um, basically to keep up with demand, you would hire on a couple of apprentices to help you. And the idea would be that as your apprentices worked for you, they would gain skills, they would eventually learn the knowledge that you had, they would progress to the point of journeyman, which is kind of like a junior partner. And eventually, once the journeyman had been uh, with a master workman long enough, they would become a master workman uh, in their own rights. Uh, sometimes they would move um, to a new locale where there wasn't a cooper already there to provide them with a lot of uh, security in their employment and in their trade. Uh, they, if the town they lived in was large enough, they might break off and uh, found their own workshop and competition with their former master, or maybe there would be a division of labor based on what kind of products each uh, workman, these master workmen in their workshops would produce. But by and large, because um, these enterprises were so small and because the amount of apprentices a master workman could take on were so few, there wasn't really ever too much of a uh, glut in, in skilled labor that made, um, that made work in skilled trades and work in workshops like this economically precarious. Now, obviously, in, a, in the event of like some sort of depression or economic recession, um, you know, no one is always 100% uh, secure, but there was a, a cultural mythos surrounding skilled labor and crafts uh, up until this point where the ability to provide for one's family, the ability to uh, be economically self-sufficient if you didn't have a farm, um, skilled labor was how you did that. And it was skilled labor and crafts workers were very much steeped in a kind of masculine politics of respectability, right? If you knew a craft and if you could provide for your family, that made you a real man versus of course, uh, immigrant laborers or unskilled laborers or like farmhands who did uh, labor that wasn't necessarily, didn't require a lot of years of experience to master. Now we talked about this geographic distance, right? Between all these different rural communities, a network of communities might not have a workshop, and so a master workman can move into this area and set up their own workshop. Because in, uh, in the system of free labor in the Midwest, also in the South, um, and up in, in, the, uh, in the industrializing Northeast, at least for a time, kind of the, the spread out nature of these rural communities made industrial development um, rather slow. It wasn't uh, for quite a long time that industrialization and uh, the immigrant labor that it brings to the United States, that there uh, develops a large enough body of non-independent journeymen in urban areas who need employment, but there is not enough uh, demand for their labor in an open market. And so as uh, these urban cities start to grow, as people start to move in there, a lot of skilled workers suddenly find that they can't necessarily always be self-sufficient. They start to um, contract their labor out to these early manufactories uh, and centers of production, which are supervised by foremen um, and are uh, working for cheaper rates than uh, a traditional master workman might say in a more rural community. Now these uh, non-independent journeymen in greater and greater numbers start to supplant these master workmen which have kind of held control of the productive process for a very long time, right? You have to keep in mind that up until the point of industrialization, if you, had, uh, if you were coming from Europe and you had a skill in say shoemaking or leatherworking or uh, metalworking or tailoring, when you got to uh, the United States, you would more or less have to find a master workman to work alongside with. Um, you didn't, you know, you couldn't bring your own workshop from Europe. It's not like you could disassemble your building and put it on the boats and bring it over. Uh, a lot of times people weren't coming with their own um, special tools. A master workman would have these. And so people coming to the United States really didn't have a lot of the capital uh, necessarily that they would need to start their own business. <clears throat> 
this gave master workmen pretty much a monopoly on on the productive process right if you want to work in this industry you have to work through me um, you eventually have to build yourself up i'm going to decide what the what the price rates are for this type of service i'm going to decide how many hours we work i'm going to decide how many um, apprentices we're going to take on so there was a lot of workers control over the productive process and when industrialization comes and these um, speculative finance and uh, industrial kind of captains of industry start to build up their own manufacturing networks this system starts to be eroded now in order to uh, exert more control over the productive process right these uh, industrialists are building their own factories um, if they are going to control the entire productive process, they cannot allow these master workmen to set things like production quotas or uh, price rates or rate or wage rates. That has to, if you're going to control a factory, that has to be, um, that has to fall under the supervision of a factory manager. That can be a foreman or it can be the person that actually owns the factory, but it can't be the workers themselves. And one of the ways that industrialists take away control of the productive process by master craftsmen and take it for themselves is through a process known as de-skilling. Now, de-skilling is where you take a uh, productive trade. It is um, a series of very complex and nuanced tasks that take a lot of like training and expertise to learn how to do correctly. And you break it down into a series of more numerous but much more simple tasks. And once you do that, right, once you take a very complex task and you break it into three smaller, easier tasks, it becomes much more easier if you are hiring out um, wage labor for people coming in off the street to work for you. It becomes a lot easier for you to create um, very special uh, commodities and products that normally would only be able to be completed or made by a master craftsman. And instead, you're able to hire uh, specific parts of that productive process out to unskilled laborers. So let's take an example of a shoemaker, right? Um, you would probably have someone measuring out all of the materials that go into making the shoe. So you would, if you're dealing with wooden shoes, you would, uh, you know, uh, carve out the wooden sole. If you're working with um, leather, you would uh, carve out um, pieces of leather, strips of leather, uh, that would go into the assembly of a shoe. Then you would have someone who's actually going through and sewing all of these pieces together. And then you might have a third individual who, uh, who does any sort of necessary finishing work. So you've taken a very complex task that not a, a lot of people know how to do, right? The, you know, can you make a shoe? Um, and instead of giving all of the responsibilities of making a shoe onto a shoemaker, you instead have a lot of individual uh, specified job classifications, right? You're not a shoemaker, you are a leather cutter. You're not a shoemaker, you're a leather sewer. You're not a shoemaker, you're a detailer. And by doing this, um, industrialists are able to break the control of master workmen and of like this apprenticeship system over the productive process and start mass producing many more goods. Now, as with industrialization as a whole, mass production of goods makes them more affordable, they make them cheaper for everyday people, and overall a lot of people's standards of living improve because they're able to buy products they might not have been able to before, or at least at uh, rates much lower than they would have to have paid before. This, however, has a kind of a negative consequence going in the other direction, where because you are selling uh, products for less, uh, ostensibly the worker and you are hiring more workers to make those products ostensibly those workers are making less in wages and this ultimately is what happens in industrialization it um, leads us to a period in American history uh, sometimes known as the Gilded Age it was a period um, of up until somewhat recently the most stratified uh, the American system had in terms of income disparity and wealth disparities so what that means is that there were very, very few uh, incredibly rich people, and most people were not rich. Um, the middle class was not a very robust uh, portion of society. And that's because workers didn't really have the control of the productive process to demand certain wage rates, for example. Um, if any of this is ringing a bell, it's because that very, very recently remark um, 
only recently has wealth stratification and income disparity in the United States kind of risen above the level it was during the Gilded Age. So sometimes uh, historians and political commentators will reference a new Gilded Age, and that's basically what they're alluding to is this income disparity. So we've talked a little about, about the means of production or the productive process. You might be asking what that is, right? The means of production is basically the sum of all parts needed for uh, you to make something, right? So uh, this includes uh, natural resources, natural resources like land, uh, raw materials, or you know, fuel um, that comes from uh, that comes from land and natural resources. So oil, um, if you're, if all of your machines are powered by solar power, um, you know, solar power would be part of that natural resource, basically the energy, um, things like lumber or anything that goes into making a product and any of the land on which the, the productive enterprise is based, right? There's also machines and tools. Um, this can range in complexity. A tool can be a monkey wrench or it can be a robot on the uh, floor of an auto factory. You also have the infrastructure that you need to make something. Now an infrastructure uh, can be a building like a factory, right? The factory that sits on the land that uh, houses the machines and tools. Infrastructure can also be road networks and uh, other sorts of other sorts of structures that facilitate commerce and spreading of commodities and goods. So the interstate highway system is an example of infrastructure. And lastly, labor, right? You need the skill and the energy in order to take these other three things and turn them into a good. And this is the means of production. Sometimes people will add uh, you know, finance to this. Uh, depends on what type of economist you ask as to whether or not finance is a means of production. But these four are pretty, uh, pretty consistent. Now, in response to the industrialization process, right, increasingly these types of natural resources, infrastructure, machinery, and tools, they start to fall uh, into the hands of only the rich. The de-skilling process um, basically makes it so that labor cannot control any of these uh, any of these processes anymore because it's too unskilled and you can't really control uh, the knowledge that goes into making a product anymore as you could have before the de-skilling process. And so in order to maintain some semblance of uh, the control of the means of production, which you know can be levied to uh, argue for increased wage rates or lower hours or um, more help on a shop floor, all of these things, if you can't control the knowledge, then what master worksmen and craftsmen and journeymen start to do is they start to form labor combinations, right? If we can't control who has the knowledge, then we can unite the people who have, who do the labor in order to uh, maintain some kind of higher standard of living. Now the legality of labor combinations and unions was pretty uncertain in the United States, uh, at least until 1842. And this comes with a Supreme Court decision in Hunt uh, v. Commonwealth, or Commonwealth v. Hunt. I think Commonwealth v. Hunt is, uh, is the proper order there. And Commonwealth v. Hunt uh, set the precedent that said that uh, guilds or unions, a guild is a, is a kind of medieval precursor to a union, they're legal, but um, they're only legal if uh, the organization, right, the union or the guild, taking part in organizing isn't also doing illegal activities. So legality at the time is a little different. Um, conspiracy is, uh, is a charge that will often be applied to unions in order to break a strike in early American labor history, right? There's a conspiracy to raise prices. There's a conspiracy to raise wages. There's a conspiracy to sabotage business. Um, but ostensibly, depending on, on the court's mood and favor, uh, if it's uh, particularly pro-labor, sometimes it will, uh, because of Commonwealth v. Hunt, side uh, on the side of some of these early labor combinations to say, hey, no, actually workers have the right to organize and they have the right to demand better, better wages. The reason that uh, the legality of these combinations was a little contested prior to this point is because up until 1842, there hadn't been much of a legal precedent um, for organized labor. 
And kind of as with that system of coverture we talked about in our lecture on reproductive labor and women's labor in revolutionary America, a lot of America's earlier legal traditions came from English common law. And in English common law, uh, you might find if you do a little digging, was much more um, inhospitable to democratic institutions run by the working class, right? America nominally was more egalitarian, whereas the English was very, uh, the English system was much more in favor of industrial capitalism and wanted to definitely incentivize that growth. Um, in the United States, there was a little more hesitation to embrace industrial capitalism, uh, at least at first. So a lot of these earlier labor combinations were essentially limited to single workshops or manufactories, right? If someone uh, built a factory in New York City to uh, produce shoes, the 30 to 40 to 100 workers who were hired to make shoes at the factory might form a union. And if their supervisor was particularly agreeable, might even negotiate with that union over wage rates uh, and production quotas. But it wasn't until after, a little bit after Commonwealth v. Hunt, that some of these smaller labor organizations start to unite in the first labor federations uh, in American history. Now, the first labor federation in the US was actually the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen. Um, it was founded in 1863 and eventually joined the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, right? The, the Teamsters are one of the major unions uh, that still exist in the United States today. And the ability of this first labor federation to join together was more or less based on uh, industrial similarities, right? If you were a locomotive engineer or a trainman, regardless of the uh, employer you had or the location you worked at, there were going to be some pretty uh, consistent factors of production that you would be familiar with, right? So like uh, the, tra the gauge and train tracks does not change uh, depending on the city you're in or the way a train engine works uh, minus some different specificities by different models. Um, a boiler is going to, or a steam engine is going to run the same way uh, in different types of train engines. And so this made it very easy for smaller unions of locomotive engineers and trainmen to join into a federation. And this provided the impetus for uh, other labor federations that weren't tied to a single industry like the railroads um, to then form. The first uh, labor federation that includes more than one industry, we should say, was the National Labor Union. And it was founded in 1866. You don't need to remember that date. I'm not going to load the midterm with a bunch of dates about like when was the Knights of Labor founded and when was its last meeting held. We're not going to do that. But it helps to look at 1866 and say, all right, this is pretty much as soon as the Civil War ends, right? You see the collapse of the chattel slave system. You see the collapse of the, you start to see the erosion of the free labor system that had existed out in the Midwest. Um, that starts to lose ground to the industrial wage system. And so the National Labor Union around this time uh, is formed. And it sees some pretty widespread support until its demise a uh, little less than a decade later. Now the National Labor Union wasn't really a union the way we look at labor unions today um, or labor federations today. Like nowadays we look at the AFL-CIO and it's really just a Congress of industrial and craft unions that uh, put forward a political program and they'll like, they'll make um, electoral uh, recommendations, right? They'll endorse certain candidates in elections, but that's essentially it. Most of the AFL-CIO's work today focuses on uh, workplace justice and uh, defending the rights of workers and basically like coordinating with different labor unions to make sure that gets done. The National Labor Union, however, was much more engrossed in electoral politics. And as it started to gain in support, it started to lean more and more into that, right? So in 1872, it runs a, a, a union labor party ticket. Um, so they have a presidential candidate, they have uh, candidates for state legislatures, state senates, governorships, these sorts of things. And they actually don't do that well. As it turns out, it's really hard to get a political party off the ground, but the National Labor Union's kind of, uh, inability to break away from electoral politics and just 
like hard-headed stubbornness and refusal to focus on aspects of labor organizing outside of representative elections eventually leads people to become disaffected um, with the NLU and uh, leave for more uh, involved in robust federations like the Knights of Labor. And we'll come back to them in a little bit. But the National Labor Union has this kind of electoral focus and it doesn't really do well for it. Um, coming a year after the National Labor Union was founded, we have the Order of the Knights of St. Crispin, and it was a little more involved in the workplace, and it fares a lot better for that, right? The, uh, the Knights of St. Crispin organized skilled workers specifically to challenge both the de-skilling process. Uh, they did this by fighting against the installation of new labor-saving machines in workshops and factories, um, but also they... Uh, they tried to fight the de-skilling process by limiting the entry of unskilled workers into workshops and apprenticeships and apprenticeships, right? If there is going to be a de-skilling process and there is going to be an introduction of individuals who are going to learn only component parts of a system of production, say for shoes or, or barrels, if you're a cooper or if you're, you know, like a blacksmith or an iron worker, then we should at least be able to set the rates at like, you know, who gets into into those workshops and who is employed and who isn't. The Knights of St. Crispin were actually marginally progressive uh, compared to some other labor organizations at the time, at least on gender issues. Uh, the St. Crispin, uh, they formed an independent women's uh, association in 1870. So they're one of the kind of the first labor organizations to, to look at women's labor and say, hey, actually, this, this idea of separate spheres isn't completely total. There are women who work in wage labor. There are women who would benefit from some form of union representation or union organizing. Um, the Knights of St. Crispin eventually allow women into the union itself instead of this segregated women's union. And women would make up about 10% of the St. Crispin's members. That being said, the, Saint, the Knights of St. Crispin were also incredibly not progressive. Uh, specifically, they were steeped in policies of racial exclusion, specifically focused uh, against Asian American immigrants. You can see a political cartoon over to the left here. Um, the Knights of St. Crispin, as a part of setting, uh, arguing for who could join and who couldn't join skilled apprenticeships or unskilled, um, unskilled factory jobs, really uh, bought into racialized uh, concepts of Asian American labor as cheaper, more affordable, requiring less substance, sustenance, or uh, material compensation. At the time, and sometimes even today, when we talk about Sinophobia and um, kind of these irrational fears of Chinese people, there is this discourse around, around the yellow peril. It's a very uh, old racialized stereotype that, set, that basically argues that Asian Americans get by on, or Asian people get by on less food, they need less money to live. And so like uh, employers are able to hire out Asian American immigrant labor for cheaper, undermining uh, the standards of living of uh, white workers, right? So the Knights of St. Crispin and some of these earlier labor organiz organizations looked at uh, immigrant labor and they specifically opposed it sometimes on a class basis, sometimes along ethnic or religious lines almost always on racial lines as well. Um, but it's worth noting that, right, uh, these labor unions would say, well, we need to stop immigration and not we need to stop abusive employment practices. So the onus fell on immigrants. Um, if that rings a bell, you know, everything old is new again. But the Knights of St. Crispin eventually saw their decline because of ineffective management and organization. The Knights of St. Crispin were not very responsive uh, to, to crises as they developed. Um, they were very slow to change. And so very similar to the National Labor Union, the Knights of St. Crispin gradually see decline as more robust unions, uh, labor federations start to uh, establish themselves. So we should go back to the railroads, right? Because 1877, we've talked about this year uh, quite a few times actually, 1877 is a pretty big uh, watershed moment in American labor history. This is when the great upheaval starts. 
Now the railroad industry, like we've already mentioned with um, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen, is really uh, America's first truly national industry, right? You have the textile industry in the North, which is dependent on the plantation agricultural uh, slave labor of the South, and then sharecropping labor after the Civil War. And out uh, in the Midwest and then further out West, you have like raw, the extraction of raw goods, like lumber, mining, these sorts of, of raw materials are making their way um, to the East Coast. But what all of the different cities and towns throughout the US have in common is that they're usually linked by a railroad point. And in 1877, the United States is actually going through a pretty bad uh, time economically. There's been um, an economic crash. There's less trade going on throughout the country. And because there's less trade, there's fewer, uh, there's less money going into the railroad industry. Now, some of the largest companies in the US at the time are railroad companies. And when they're faced with this decline in incomes, they, uh, make, they make do not by cutting, cutting executive salaries or um, by lowering rates to encourage you know, a greater use of the railroads, but they start to slash wages and they start to make pretty deep wage cuts for workers across the, in, the industry. Uh, one of the worst offenser, uh, offenders was actually Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, or B&O. They uh, call for wage cuts that are so deep that workers just across their company in cities, like regardless of where they're at, right? Um, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, Toledo, Cincinnati. If there is a B&O stop, workers start to strike because ultimately they can't live on on the wages that BNO was asking them to live on. Um, this, of course, is it bears repeating that railroad uh, work in the railroad industry was not easy. It was not safe. Uh, if you recall, um, I have a a quote here from Loomis's Ten Strikes, that chapter one that we read for last class, it talks about uh, one train engineer named Nicholas Farwell. He was uh, working for the Worcester Railroad Corporation in Boston. Um, a switchman actually made a mistake, uh, put him on the wrong track when the train uh, switched over tracks in a way that Farwell wasn't ready for. He fell off the train and uh, the train actually ran, the locomotive uh, ran over his hand. Uh, he lost his hand, obviously, he didn't die. But because there was no system of workers' compensation, uh, or there wasn't any kind of federal employment system in place, there wasn't really any kind of assurances that he would be able to get another job, support his family, work and eat. Now, Farwell eventually sues uh, the Worcester Railroad Co Corporation, but because his case falls under a court that's not specifically pro-labor, but is actually pro-business, the judge ultimately says, you know, hey, the $2 that you make in a week is uh, is more than adequate compensation for the risks that this job entails. So, you know, if you wanna sue uh, the switchman who made the mistake and bumped you off the train, feel more than free, but the, the railroad was paying you enough for this. And so as far as we know, Farwell uh, never actually gets any form of compensation for losing her, his hand on the railroad. Uh, this just to demonstrate how dangerous railroad work could be. And when you have these pretty uh, extensive and um, stark wage cuts. It pushes a lot of people over the edge. Now, uh, initially starting off, depending on who you ask, some people will say it started off in Baltimore, Maryland. Others will say it happened in uh, Wheeling, West Virginia. Others will point to a third kind of uh, jumping off point for this, this great upheaval. But regardless, as the strike starts to spread in 1877 from its focal point, it basically goes uh, across the entire country. In major cities uh, that serve as railroad hubs, like St. Louis and Chicago, you start to see these things called general strikes. A general strike is essentially a strike, but it involves an entire community, right? So instead of just railroad workers striking, um, in places like St. Louis, you would have people who weren't working uh, for the railroad industry also walk off their jobs and say, you know what, um, I'm not working in this textile mill, I'm not working in this processing uh, plant facility, I'm not working in this Cooper workshop because um, I need to stand up for the railroad workers who are suffering right now. 
And so with a general strike, uh, a lot of uh, American cities economically start to ground to a halt. And the hope with a general strike is that if everyone kind of acts together in solidarity across industrial divisions, um, workers will, will win the concessions they want. The two major organizations that are behind the 1877 strikes that are spreading across the country are um, the Working Men's Party of the United States, one of the first kind of socialist or Marxist political organizations in the US, and the Knights of Labor, which was founded less than 10 years earlier in 1869. And it starts to gain membership uh, by virtue of involving communities, uh, involving working class neighborhoods directly in uh, strikes and other labor campaigns. So it's much more steeped right at the point of production and it bases itself on community membership. So a lot of people are leaving groups like the Knights of St. Crispin and the National Labor Union to join the KOL because they view it as more effective. And the uh, 1877 railroad strike, this great upheaval is kind of their proving ground. General strikes, at least in American history, are pretty rare. Um, usually, if you're going to compel the entire population of a city to rise up and, and join mass pickets and marches to occupy government buildings and company offices, these sorts of things that, uh, you know, this leftist militancy that can be tied to these general strikes, circumstances need to be pretty bad. And overall, in general, the U.S. has been a pretty prosperous country. And so the degree of labor unrest that we see uh, in the Great Upheaval and in other um, sorts of incidents where there have been general strikes like 1919 out on the West Coast, uh, it's not regular. Now, because of their wide scope, they're almost always perceived as a, as a pretty major threat. Um, one industry, if workers go on strike, the economy can kind of navigate around them. But when an entire city or group of cities start to just shut down economic production, um, that's when the federal government and business interests really start to, to see the need for an immediate, uh, for immediate action, right? The longer the strike goes on, the more economically we suffer because we can't really navigate around a general strike. Now, in the Great Upheaval, uh, popular support and harsh circumstances were so total that um, records uh, have, you know, strike participant counts upwards of 100,000. Um, keep in mind that this is uh, when the U.S. population was very, very low. Um, strikes of 100,000 today are pretty rare. The last major strike that happened in the U.S. was uh, two years ago. The UAW's 55,000 members at GM went on strike, made national news. Um, but even that 55,000 strike in a country with a current population of 400 million, um, that making national news it pales in comparison to 100,000 workers across the U.S. on strike with a much smaller population, right? The much greater proportion of, of workers at that time were on strike. Now, despite the, the desire of business interests and the government to kind of rein in these strikes, uh, they weren't really able to do it. When local authorities and these unofficial militias kind of prompted by uh, the government and by newspapers, when they arrived at work sites to um, end you know, factory occupations or get trains moving again, riots and looting followed, right? The police then, and some would uh, argue as now, are not really trained uh, to de-escalate uh, nonviolent protests. Police are usually uh, more oriented toward like stopping violent crime or apprehending like people who uh, commit like crimes or, or violent acts. Um, but when you're faced with like crowds of thousands of people who are occupying a building, uh, there's not much the police can really do. And if you're trying to force them out, uh, there's fewer options available to them. And so ultimately, when police try and force strikers out of these work sites to break the strike, they get pushback that they can't really deal with. Um, ultimately, railroad companies like Baltimore and Ohio have to request for backup from federal troops 
Uh, so the US government actively deployed the army against striking workers to suppress the great upheaval. This is one of the reasons we see the end of reconstruction is that in order to deploy uh, enough troops to quell the great upheaval, a lot of those troops had to be pulled out of the reconstructing South, um, prematurely ending reconstruction in that area. By the end of the year though, um, you know, beginning in, I believe, April, and then lasting until September, by the, uh, by the end of fall, the strike has been crushed by federal troops. At least 100 striking workers were killed in nationwide violence uh, with the deployment of federal troops against the strikers, and upwards of 1,000 at the very least were arrested. Um, depending on historical accounts you read and how numbers are tabulated, the 1,000 amount can get much, much higher. Now, in deploying the National Guard to suppress the strikes, the ineffectiveness of a lot of police forces become uh, somewhat of a national issue. In a lot of locations, National Guardmen and police actually expressed open sympathy for the strikers. They would refuse to fire on them or they would refuse to force them out of the buildings and trains they were occupying. And some of them, depending on their political leanings and the situation of other members of their families, would even break lines to join protesters, right? This is uh, back when we had a more uh, community-based policing approach in, in law enforcement, where someone who uh, policed a neighborhood and policed a city usually lived there. Uh, this included the National Guard. And so when a National Guardsman is deployed to a factory to force workers out of a building and shoot them if you have to, they're less likely to do that if they, see, uh, if they see their brother on the third floor leaning out the window, right? This is why nowadays, if you're deployed in the National Guard, odds are, um, unless you're in the reserve, you're not going to be assigned to a base that's like right by your house. Um, after the 1877 strike, there's a lot of reforms that are pushed through regarding the National Guard and policing and law enforcement that make uh, their culpability in labor actions um, less likely and more difficult to encourage. Now, these buildings kind of look like uh, Old Main at Wayne State University. Uh, Wayne State, uh, as far as I'm aware, Old Main was never an armory. But when you see these kinds of buildings um, in smaller towns across the country, they actually owe their construction to the 1877 Great Upheaval, right? Um, if you're familiar with Eric Loomis's reading when he discusses Pawtucket, uh, one of the sites of unrest in the Great Upheaval was at Pawtucket. Um, this armory on the left here, the red building, was constructed. Uh, on the right, you have another armory that was constructed in Rhode Island a um, decade or so after the 1877 Great Upheaval. Because of the widespread extent of labor unrest and strikes and just economic uh, chaos that's going on at the time, one of the legacies of the 1877 strike is that you start to see these armories uh, built all across the country. Um, in addition, to kind of this uh, reorganization of uh, policing and uh, National Guard policies and the construction of all these armories, the, the kind of rapid and notable success of some of these more left-weaning organizations like the Workingmen's Party, uh, but also the Knights of Labor, kind of terrify um, some of the more uh, pro-business groups in the United States, right? The 1877 railroad strike, um, convinced a lot of Americans that uh, there was a communist revolution on the horizon, that there would be a socialist upheaval akin to the, uh, the Paris Commune, which had uh, been established six years prior in 1871. Ultimately, the French army had to retake uh, its own capital from workers who had occupied Paris, set up barricades, and were governing themselves um, kind of independently of the more business-friendly National Assembly. These kinds of worker uprisings in the Gilded Age and the industrial era generally um, really kept a lot of industrialists, business leaders, um, and kind of these, uh, these financiers at the edge of their seats, right? 
at the time, there wasn't really any uh, kind of uh, coordinated National Labor Relations Board where unions and employers could peacefully arbitrate. And so it, um, it was very easy for a strike to, to turn violent and get out of hand if it was handled improperly. And if the situation was right, um, that strike and that labor action could, could get more and more uh, violent and it could spread. And so the, the legacy of the 1870 strike also includes this kind of emergence of a red terror in the United States, right? Sometimes people will talk about the Red Scare and they have to specify that there was a first and a second one. Um, but if you look at 1877 and you look at the kind of anti-labor backlash that comes from the great upheaval, you could even say that there are three or four or five Red Scares with the 1877 strike being the first one. Uh, but this is kind of like the start of this anti-labor hostility that kind of uh, grows and grows as we get further and further into the Industrial Gilded Age. The Knights of Labor see a rapid rise in membership in 1880, just three years after uh, the Great Upheaval. They only have about 28,000 members, but as they continue to um, organize and grow and kind of build on the successes of their involvement in the Great Upheaval, they eventually uh, grow to have about 800,000 members by 1886. Now these numbers are a little inflated, right? Um, someone can uh, pay dues uh, to the Knights of Labor as a labor union. They can say, yeah, I wanna be a member and they can pay their dues for a month um, before their membership expires. And it might be that uh, that other people are members at different points of the year because you know I paid my dues in January and February, but then I quit paying them and someone else started paying in August and in September. So the 800,000 number you have to take with a little grain of salt. Um, but if it's even marginally accurate, that would mean that an estimated 20% of the American workforce was organized by the Knights of Labor. You might think about this number and think, wow, that's actually pretty impressive, right? Today, uh, unionization rates hover at about 10 or 11 percent. Um, the highest unionization rate the United States has ever had was basically right after World War II and into the 1950s, uh, when you had this kind of uh, this gradual stepping towards industrial democracy before the Red Scare kind of pushes the U.S. back from that. Um, you'll see numbers closer to 30 percent union participation. So this 20% seems uh, pretty monumental, right? The Knights of Labor is going to be able to demand a lot of concessions and uh, there's going to be a lot of labor power going forward, right? Yeah, not exactly. The Knights of Labor um, had a specific kind of approach toward organizing that is known as community-based unionism. Now there are different types to, uh, of approaches to organizing labor that we're gonna cover. Um, three major ones. And the first two we're going to talk about in today's lecture. Community unionism is this approach uh, that the Knights of Labor took. It differed from the National Labor Union, which was much more focused on electoral politics. Community unionism argues that by involving, involving all the members of working class communities uh, into labor strikes and labor actions, you know, instead of restricting involvement to individuals and workers at specific work sites. If you involve everyone in a community, then strikes and other labor actions will have more support and they'll be able to uh, put greater pressure on businesses um, to negotiate over, over labor and community issues, right? So I might have a job at an auto factory and my neighbor might have a job at an auto factory or some kind of manufactory because cars hadn't been really invented yet. Um, so we have two people uh, in a modern union who might go to a picket line, but under the Knights of Labor, which organizes entire communities, right? So you would have like a Detroit local of the Knights of Labor. You might have like a Toledo uh, local of the Knights of Labor. Suddenly, uh, me and my spouse and me and my neighbor's spouses and our two other neighbors and one of our adult children, right, that's over the age of 18. Now all of us are in the Knights of Labor and we can all go pick at a work site or we can all boycott a business or uh, you know depending what we have to do to challenge business on a labor issue. So when we think about that 800,000 number it's worth keeping in mind that not all of those workers were in the same industry the same way that the UAW has you know 300,000 members now. Um, that was spread over a lot of different industries and a lot of different communities and so 
the ability of the Knights of Labor to actually contest uh, with businesses over labor and community issues could be limited depending on circumstances, right? If uh, the Knights of Labor wanted to challenge an industrial, like a company that had, um, that had sites of production in many different towns, it might be harder to do that because, well, workers in Detroit might want to strike. That doesn't mean that workers in Cleveland or, uh, I'm blanking on other Ohio names, Akron, uh, Dayton, anyway, it doesn't mean that other workers in other cities would also want to strike. And so this is kind of um, a little bit of a con to community unionism, right? The pros are that you have greater involvement of the community, um, greater structures of support. You can address wider social issues than individual like workplace issues and grievances. But there are some cons there. The mass involvement of a lot of different people uh, really kind of, it necessitates a decentralized structure, right? What works for workers in one city doesn't work for them in another. And this makes uh, cooperation and collaboration across different communities very difficult. It also means that if you give a local in say Atlanta, right, if there's a nice of labor uh, local in Atlanta, that's incredibly racist and xenophobic. If it has a lot of, if the, if the union is decentralized and that local has a lot of independence, then it can, you know, adopt policies that promote segregation, even though the actual union, which is based in the North, might be opposed to them. So there's a con to community unionism too, and that's like this decentralized nature and the inability to kind of like keep organizational discipline going to effectively challenge businesses. Now we should talk a little bit about exclusion in the labor movement and the labor aristocracy. We've already kind of talked about how the Knights of St. Crispin took this very um, sinophobic and uh, anti-immigrant stance towards uh, workers who were coming to the United States. Um, a lot of this was focused specifically on people coming to the U.S. from Asia, but it also included people coming to the U.S. from Eastern Europe. It also included workers, um, freed slaves in the South who were uh, working on sharecropping, who were kind of perceived as undermining um, the living standards of white workers in the South who were uh, competing with them in the wage market. This kind of exclusion uh, factored pretty heavily into earlier labor organizing, and it contributed to something that we call the labor aristocracy. Now, the labor aristocracy is basically this division among the working class by unskilled and skilled jobs, right? So a lot of unskilled labor, um, a lot of skilled labor was controlled by early labor combinations. So, you know, you get this image of the, of the master craftsman and his workshop. Um, these were usually more affluent social groups. Uh, they came from uh, more normative and white backgrounds. Um, and because of their community, uh, ethnic, and other cultural ties, they would usually hire on or take on as apprentices other people who were also white straight men spoke English. Um, skilled labor was very heavily dominated by these kinds of by these kinds of white men. In contrast, unskilled labor was uh, essentially left to everyone else, right? If you couldn't get a trade, if you couldn't get a, a craft, then you had to sell your labor on the industrial labor market just for wages alone. You didn't really have that say over the productive process. And this meant on average, you were going to have lower wages, you were going to have less secure employment, and you were gonna have fewer benefits if benefits provided by an employer were even uh, an option to begin with. Now, because of the Knights of Labor's decentralized structure, you know, uh, to win members, right? Uh, if we set up a local in, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, and we want to get a bunch of dues paying members, we're going to let them make their own bylaws, their own constitution, draft their own rules. That essentially means that the Knights of Labor in Tennessee, even though the Knights of Labor in that's headquartered in the Northeast, even though they might have anti-racist views, the Chattanooga local can adopt uh, segregationist policies, it can exclude black members, it can exclude women, it can exclude immigrants. And that kind of decentralized nature kind of contributes to this system of a labor aristocracy, where some skilled craft workers who are majoritively male and white 
are faring a lot better and they're enjoying higher wages than other workers who are primarily pushed toward the unskilled labor sector. So we talked about Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, examples of labor uh, of exclusion and uh, this contributing to the labor aristocracy, obviously racial segregation is a big example here. Now policies um, that were exclusionary and racist might be protested by national leaders, but again, that decentralized nature of the KOL really kind of kept them from reigning, uh, reigning in these Southern locals or really doing anything to effectively stop segregationist practices. Um, the Knights of Labor offered women membership after 1878. Uh, and while you could get membership in the Knights of Labor, that doesn't mean that you could actually um, become a member in your local assembly if your local assembly had an anti-woman policy, right? We've talked about um, mill girls, we've talked about the system of coverture and how a lot of women who went to, especially the industrial Northeast, kind of at the outset of industrialization, they started working in these mill towns and these, uh, these manufactories and these, um, these textile mills and because it was assumed that they were under coverture, that they were basically uh, provided for by their fathers or future husbands, um, employers would justify paying them below regular wages for other kinds of labor. And so kind of uh, in the same vein as to why some of these early labor unions opposed immigrant labor, opposed Asian American labor, they would also oppose women, uh, women's labor, right? They would impose women's involvement in labor organizations because they felt that women were driving down the wages of men who had to, you know, uh, work for a family wage to provide for uh, their wife and children, right? This, of course, overlooks the fact that a lot of women were breadwinners, um, either because their husbands weren't breadwinners or because they didn't have husbands, but. Um, times being what they are, it was very white and male centric. So a lot of labor organizations would also exclude women. And coming back to what we said about uh, Chinese exclusion um, or just Asian immigrant exclusion just on a holistic level, a lot of labor organizations um, specifically uh, adopted very racist and anti-Asian sentiments uh, when it came to industrial labor, community and immigration policies. So kind of like African-American laborers in the South and women's labor in the Northeast, uh, unions out West, sometimes we look at um, out West like California, you know, Portland, Seattle, um, these kinds of places as being incredibly progressive. They were also kind of steeped in their own history of racism and, and racial exclusion. And when you had a lot of Asian American immigrants coming to the U.S., you had a lot of Chinese laborers coming to the U.S. either to work in textiles, to work on the railroad, to work in mining. There were a lot of different industries that immigrants uh, coming from East Asia would, um, would start working in. There emerged this racist uh, notion again around the yellow peril, right? We're being, uh, sometimes it's uh, depicted as a horde um, because of, I guess, I guess it's tied to like a uh, Mongolian step culture, just stereotypes around that, this idea of a giant horde. Um, racism doesn't make sense. I don't know why they really characterized it that way, but nevertheless, this yellow peril was kind of tied to this notion of like an incoming invading horde of laborers who are gonna drive down wages and drive down uh, standards of living, right? The onus obviously there is placed on uh, Asian American immigrants who are coming to the US for a better life and for job opportunities and not on business leaders who were kind of taking advantage uh, of them and the vulnerability that immigrants have when they first arrived to the country. But with this labor aristocracy in place, right, this idea that craft skilled workers who have some uh, control over the process of production, it's steeped in respectability politics. And we'll come back to this in a little bit, but because of the, of the culture surrounding uh, skilled labor and the culture surrounding um, craft labor that kind of had a, provided workers who had trades and skills with an elevated position above unskilled, quote unquote, unskilled uh, industrial laborers. There was this attempt to kind of find middle ground between business and, and the rest of the working class, 
And so a lot of times unions would kind of jump on top of this, uh, this racialized bandwagoning and support things like the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Uh, this made it very hard for uh, Asian immigrants to, to come to the United States after 1882. Um, they would jump on to these, uh, these very short-sighted and um, problematic solutions to low wages uh, under the belief that it was ultimately better for the members of the kind of elevated craft labor aristocracy, even though it might not actually help uh, the working class unskilled labor pool that much. This is an example of the labor aristocracy, this diagram here on the right. Up at the top, you obviously have industrial capitalists, kind of the people who own factories, the people who um, own the means of production, all the natural resources, all the land, all of the machinery. They're kind of at the head of this hierarchy here in the, in the new wage labor system. Underneath them, you have kind of smaller business owners who are still engaged in trade and uh, commerce, who um, are able to make a living without uh, selling their labor in a market. Uh, beneath them uh, is when we start to see skilled and then unskilled workers, right? So just above unskilled workers, you have skilled craft workers like coopers who make these barrels or boiler makers or locomotive engineers who have very special skills and who are resisting the de-skilling process, but are also not as militant as some unskilled workers because they have this desire to appear, you know, manly and quintessentially American and respectable. Um, beneath the craft skilled workers, which are primarily uh, the, the folks that the Knights of Labor is trying to organize and that other unions at the time were really focused on, you have unskilled industrial workers. Now, these workers uh, work in industries that don't necessarily require a lot of skill. Things like mining, uh, textiles, textile production. Now, obviously, uh, when we say unskilled, we have to come in with the caveat that none of us could jump into an 18th century textile mill and start doing that job without any sort of training. But that in order to learn the job of a, of a textile mill, does, you, know, it, you might learn it over the course of a month, um, depending on what the job is, to do it effectively, versus if you're going to be a cooper or a boiler maker, you're going to be apprenticing for many years and even decades. So unskilled isn't really unskilled, it's just it requires less training. Um, but because the skilled craft workers at the time are so opposed to the de-skilling process, uh, a lot of times they're going to be at odds with the, with the desires and interests of unskilled industrial workers. And then, of course, even below unskilled industrial wage workers, you have uh, people who are still kind of forced or compelled to work. The chattel system of slavery has, uh, has you know, ostensibly been abolished in the United States at this time, but it's... That doesn't mean that you still don't have slave labor. Uh, if you read the 13th Amendment, it abolishes slavery except under certain parameters. Like if someone commits a crime, the state still has the right to require they work for free. Um, if there is like uh, an, an excessive amount of debt up until a certain point, it was okay for the US government to force them to work or to lease out their labor to, to different companies. Um, if you talk about anti-vagrancy laws, this was a way uh, that the South was able to kind of force African-American workers into the system of sharecropping. That is, if you don't have a job, we're going to find you guilty of, um, of violating vagrancy regulations. And so we'll, you know, if you don't have a job, we'll put you to work. So that's another example of forced labor. So uh, under, underneath the unskilled industrial workers who are still kind of uh, working in wage labor, you also have this convict or forced labor. A uh, good example of this, if, uh, if you ever go down to Florida, there is a road that goes from Tampa to Miami called the Tamiami Trail. That was um, made entirely by uh, slave convict labor, for example. So this is kind of this American labor aristocracy and uh, the labor movement at the time is still very much oriented toward representing skilled craft workers. And if unskilled industrial workers are being represented also during this time, it's, it's an added benefit, but it's not necessarily the goal of a lot of these early unions. Now I've been talking about craft and skills a lot. 
And well, we've been talking about the Knights of Labor, which is an ostensibly a community union. Um, you're going to see uh, other labor organizations start to challenge the Knights of Labor. Specifically, the American Federation of Labor is going to focus more and more on, on workplace organizing and less on community organizing. And part of that is just comes from effectiveness, right? When you have uh, when you have a local of a union that is only a geographic area, there is going to be a lot of disagreement based on members in that local. Uh, what kind of action should be taken um, in some sort in a in a in a disagreement on a labor issue, right? And so this can actually limit the effectiveness of a community union. And so as time starts to go on and the Knights of Labor isn't as effective as people would like it to be, though still more effective than, than electoral groups like the National Labor Union, um, as people start to realize that the Knights of Labor isn't really the be all end all, they start to leave for more uh, focused unions or craft unions. A craft union, just as its name suggests, is essentially when a union organizes only around the skill uh, of a certain job, right? So a good example of a craft union would be like the boiler makers, uh, the pipe fitters, right? So it's not just like a plumber's union or a union that represents a neighborhood. It's specifically all of the pipe fitters in this area are going to associate with this union. And because you're all of the people that know how to do pipe fitting, we're going to be able to to kind of set uh, wage rates, we're gonna be able to set the production quotas, we're gonna be able to set timetables. So kind of an attempt to return to this master workman journeyman and apprentice system that industrialization had been chipping away at. Of course, the problem is that craft unionism only works for jobs that are still skilled and haven't been de-skilled yet. The de-skilling process, of course, is going to make craft unionism not possible for jobs that are, that essentially only you know, require minimal training now. Uh, professions that have already been de-skilled, it's going to be very hard to organize those, those industries because if a worker joins a union, um, they can be easily fired or replaced. And that's if, the, uh, if craft unions themselves even view it necessarily as worth organizing. Again, sometimes it's worth repeating that the early labor movement and craft union organizing uh, very much is steeped around a politics of masculinity and respectability and providing for the family and you know republican citizenship and so you know sometimes if uh if there's pressure uh within a craft union to push for organizing unskilled workers there will be pushback you know why do we need to organize them they're not really laborers they're just kind of you know unskilled wage grunts there's you know that's that labor aristocracy kind of dividing the working class along these uh these lines of of skilled versus unskilled so as we said, over time, the Knights of Labor's growth uh, eventually un makes it unable to win strikes. It's too decentralized. It can't really coordinate or, or force locals to agree to certain policies. And then, you know, just the rapid growth, uh, the inability of the Knights of Labor to, to foster a movement or organizational culture that keep people loyal to the labor union. Um, this doesn't ever really happen. And so a lot of the people who join up with the Knights of Labor ultimately after a couple of years or even a couple of months just decide, oh, I thought this was gonna be different. I thought it was gonna be more effective. This isn't really for me. And so they would then leave. Um, the Knights of Labor's membership starts to decline. Um, increasingly, members in the Knights of Labor are instead going and joining up with the American Federation of Labor or the AFL was actually founded by disaffected members of the Knights of Labor in 1881. The AFL or AFL is an example of a craft union federation where the AFL organized craft unions specifically, uh, whereas the KOL was still very much wedded to this idea of community unionism, which was great for rapid growth and instituting general strikes, but if you're not instituting a general strike uh, and you're not able to push through like electoral reforms that benefit people, then, you know, why are they paying dues? So eventually the Knights of Labor starts to decline. By the end of the 1880s, it's essentially a dead organization, though there are a couple locals and lodge houses that last into the 20th century. The last Knights of Labor uh, local officially disbanded in 1949. But by that point, it's already had been irrelevant for a few decades. And it's largely supplanted by the American Federation of Labor and its system of craft unions. 
So right, a craft union in contrast to community unionism advocates for the organization of workers into combinations or union locals on the basis of specific skills. So if we're taking uh, the Midwest as an example, you would no longer have a Detroit Knights of Labor local, but you would have you know, a pipe fitters local in Detroit and you would have an electrician's local in Detroit, like these different specific skills. Now you may be asking, why couldn't the Knights of Labor and the American Federation of Labor just kind of work together and share members, right? Um, why isn't it possible to have a Detroit labor local as well as a bunch of different craft locals within in Detroit, if we're using Detroit as an example? And that's because a lot of unions uh, throughout this period and even today are very suspicious of what is known as dual unionism. Now, dual unionism is kind of a pejorative term that's applied to, um, it's applied to labor unions that are in competition with each other, right? Oftentimes, companies, in order to break up a union, would, would just create a rival union that was backed financially by the company, was given a lot of uh, specific privileges within the company that would draw workers away from a craft union and into this dual company union. And a lot of companies in the early industrial era used dual unionism to their advantage. Um, they were able to defeat a lot of craft union organizing efforts by basically offering workers slightly better conditions if they just joined the company union. And so this fostered this system of exclusion within the labor movement that said, you know, basically a, a one union policy. You're either in this union or you're in this union. Um, nowadays, if you are an electrician, you're either in the IBEW or in the, you're in the UE. You're not in both. Uh, and that's because a lot of times they're competing for the, sim, uh, the same group of members. If you are a teacher, you might be in the National Education Association, which is very different from the American Federation of Teachers. So there might be charges of dual unionism between those two unions. Um, so even though unions might fill different purposes, it has been very difficult to encourage workers to join more than one union at a time because of this fear that there might be uh, charges of dual unionism and that one of these unions might have actually been created to kind of defeat the organizing uh, successes and efforts of a, a, you know, a different union that it's either indirectly or indirectly competing with. And again, sometimes I just kind of talk ahead of myself and we get to the, uh, the next slide and it just has all of my information there anyways. But right, just to recap that, uh, a community union could organize workers in a given city or town and a craft union would create far smaller but more focused and more effective locals. So you might have a boiler repairman, a shoemaker, or a cigar roller instead of just, you know, this is the Toledo union. Um, these smaller craft unions are more able to respond quickly and appropriately to shop floor situations. But in terms of wider communities, these craft unions, right, which are more uh, inclusive, not inclusive, they're more um, internally focused on their specific skilled craft workers. This ultimately kind of contributes to this labor aristocracy where the, where the union uh, movement is more focused on maintaining the privileges of skilled workers than it is on lifting up the status of all industrial wage earners. And that's gonna take us essentially to the founding of the AFL and its growth. Um, after the decline of the Knights of Labor, the American Federation of Labor is essentially going to be a hegemon um, in the American labor movement. It's gonna get challenges from some more inclusive and radical unions, uh, like the Industrial Workers of the World, the Western Federation of Miners, the United Mine Workers. Eventually in the 1930s, though this is gonna come after uh, our midterm, it's, uh, the AFL is going to be directly challenged by the CIO, which is an industrial union, and we'll talk about that uh, later on. But let's recap on what we've learned in this lecture, right? First, the American labor movement grew as the country continued to industrialize, and workers whose professions faced uh, the de-skilling process ultimately were trying to retain control over their standards of work. When you could control the productive process, that meant you could set your wages, it could set, you could set your hours, and you could set um, your production quotas, right? So 
I'm going to work 10 hours a day. I'm going to work not too fast, but you know, enough to make some money. And these are going to be my wages, right? Uh, as industrialization continues and there's greater and greater national emphasis placed on profitability and economic growth, this, uh, this system is going to be sidelined for more de-skilled wage labor where you report to work, you have a very simple job, and you have a very high production quota for a very low wage. Um, a lot of the early labor movement is directly resisting this by protecting craft skilled trades and crafts. Um, but because of that, they are not very receptive to uh, the unskilled working class that uh, constitute the majority of industrial laborers. There are different approaches to organizing in the American labor movement. This is the second takeaway. They include the National Labor Union's political orientation, its participation in electoral politics. The National Labor Union did not do well in the, uh, the 1860s and 1870s elections, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that approach doesn't enjoy successes in other countries, right? Outside of the United States, a lot of uh, political part, uh, a lot of political groups and labor unions have specifically conjoined to form what's called labor parties uh, that advocate for workers' uh, specific interests in national uh, and regional elections. The United States doesn't have a labor party, but a lot of industrialized nations do. Um, a labor party isn't really uh, doesn't really fit into a two-party system that well, but in uh, political systems that allow for more than two primary parties, labor parties uh, are, you know, fairly effective, depending on who you ask. And then lastly, uh, racial, gendered, and other forms of exclusion have prevented wider class-based solidarity in the history of the early American labor movement. So racial exclusion, uh, exclusion based on sex, and that, you know, that racial exclusion, mind you, is not just anti-Black, but it can just be aimed at any person of color, whether they're from East Asia, South America, or Eastern Europe, or the Middle East. Um, there's these kinds of racial and gendered forms of exclusion contributed to uh, very real distinctions uh, in the working class that separated skilled and unskilled workers. Um, this all contributed to something called the labor aristocracy, and that in and of itself also prevented um, wider kind of pan working class collaboration and uni unity. That sort of division is actually going to last well into the 1950s. Uh, it's not until 1955 that the AFL and CIO officially merge. Um, and even today, there's uh, labor federations in the US that are in competition with the AFL-CIO. And some of, their, uh, some of the factors that kind of contribute to their lasting division can be tied to, um, can be tied to arguments of racial and gendered exclusion, but also of uh, arguments that they're contributing to or maintaining this labor aristocracy. So I threw a lot of vocab terms at everyone uh, for this lecture. So let's just run through them really quick. De-skilling is a process where a uh, productive trade is broken down into smaller, less complex tasks that can be uh, completed without a lot of training. The de-skilling process uh, basically made it so that master craftsmen and journeymen and apprentices didn't hold sole power over the productive process anymore. The means of production um, and the productive process. These are all the components that are necessary to make commodities. Remember that's land and natural resources. It is machinery and tools. It is the actual like infrastructure that labor is performed on and in. So like manufactories, mills, uh, rail and road networks. And then of course labor, right? Uh, you don't, you can't really make any kind of commodity if you don't have labor power. Commonwealth v. Hunt was a Supreme Court ruling in the uh, 1840s that established that guilds and unions were legal. This, of course, came with the caveat that they didn't advocate or take part in illegal activities while they were organizing. That's a convenient caveat because uh, depending on the government's attitude toward business and labor, um, what might be legal for a labor union one year is illegal the next year. Uh, we also talked about a general strike. General strikes are when uh, an entire community uh, comes out to halt economic production uh, as opposed to a strike that is limited to one workplace or one industry. General strikes, of course, are rare and they are usually not 
uh, responded to with the greatest degree of um, the greatest degree of kindness by business or the government. It's because there is that existential threat there. Um, if we have some more terms here, we have community unionism. That's when your labor organizing involves all members of working class communities. You kind of uh, break your organization into locals dependent on geographic areas, neighborhoods, communities like that. It can be easier to grow your membership that way, but it can be harder to actively uh, challenge workplace abuses. Craft unionism, by contrast, um, focuses on combining workers who have specific skills uh, into uh, much smaller but more focused locals. This is more effective at challenging uh, the control of business and supervisors of the productive process by kind of uniting everyone with one skill uh, to work in solidarity against them and to collect and bar uh, co bargain collectively. Um, but at the same time, craft unionism can contribute to the emergence and perpetuation of a labor aristocracy that uh, that privileges the standards of living of craft workers over the standards of living of um, quote unquote unskilled industrial laborers. Dual unionism is a practice where you can create a parallel competing union to take members away from a union that already exists. Uh, this can negatively affect um, the ability of both unions to win concessions and organize effectively and has been done by companies um, for a very long time to challenge the labor movement. But not only uh, have companies done this, but other organizations have done this. Um, charges of dual unionism have been levied against uh, more militant unions that have been created by socialists and communists to challenge you know, uh, craft unions that might be less hospitable to the concerns of unskilled industrial laborers. And then labor aristocracy, again, as we just said, is this elevated class position that's held by skilled craft workers um, that kind of keeps them above primarily unskilled industrial laborers. And I threw a lot of labor organizations at you um, just to run through in brief chronological order. The National Labor Union was essentially the first, if you uh, exclude the, the Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen Brotherhood in Detroit. It focused on electoral politics, but wasn't really able to make it in a two-party system, and so it ultimately declined. The Order of the Knights of St. Crispin and the Knights of Labor uh, kind of filled this intermediate gap here, where um, they focused more on community unionism as a way to uh, unite neighborhoods and kind of challenge the de-skilling process. This, of course, uh, they were not as effective in as they could have been, because when you have a community union, there's a lot more... Uh, uh, conflicting voices and concerns that you have to take into consideration. This can kind of limit how effective you are. And then uh, with the decline of these two unions in 1886, you see the rise of the American Federation of Labor and its style of organizing known as craft unionism that specifically focuses on the skills and jobs in a workplace that uh, skilled laborers have. So, all of this is to say that when we look at the American labor movement, when we look at the growth of unions, it's not, a, it's not an overnight, first there were no unions and then there were unions that this 1877 start date can sometimes imply, right? Not only have people been working and laboring uh, since the dawn of time, but Disagreements, discussions, debates over how to organize workers and how to effectively represent the interests of all laborers, skilled or unskilled. Um, all of these discussions are not easily decided on. And uh, the development of the labor movement has taken a long kind of winding road to get to where we are with the founding of the American Federation of Labor at the end of the 1800s, the end of the 19th century, and that the concerns of some workers uh, in this process have been privileged over the concerns of others, and that directly ties to a lot of other ongoing uh, kind of trends and themes running throughout American history, right, as the previous three lectures may have hinted at. 
If anything in this lecture didn't really kind of make sense, or if you have any lasting questions, feel free to email me, or you can also save your questions for our discussion on October 12th. Um, ahead of time, just make sure to read chapters one and two of Elizabeth Fowles Rethinking the American Labor Movement. It's about 60 pages. Also read Eight Hour Day Strikes. Um, that's chapter three in Loomis's 10 Strikes, about 20, 20 pages. And uh, also while you're doing that reading and you're getting ready for our next discussion, start thinking about your research topic. Um, keep in mind that we're going to have a finalized research topic due by the 26th when we break for our midterm exam. Um, so keep that in mind and make sure that you have a, a topic to submit when that, uh, that benchmark assignment is due. All right, and I will see you on the 12th.